You've probably heard that there have been some new medications approved for Alzheimer's disease and that they may slow the rate of progression in a meaningful way. You might have also heard about some of the controversy involved with some of these, including overall efficacy, risks, and feasibility. Today, we're looking at the most recent medication to gain approval, denanumab. Is this something you should discuss with your patients as an option? Let's take a look. I'm Scott Beach, and this is Quick Takes. Denanumab is a monoclonal antibody treatment, similar to two other medications that have been approved in recent years. The first of those was aducanumab, later withdrawn from the market. The second was lacanumab, which was approved last year and is still in use. All of these medications work by reducing beta amyloid plaque in the brain, based on the theory that Alzheimer's is driven by accumulation of this plaque and the subsequent accumulation of tau protein, though that causal theory is still unproven. The major placebo-controlled trial involving denanumab was known as the Trailblazer II trial and was published in JAMA in 2023. The trial lasted 18 months and involved about 1,700 participants. The main outcome was the Integrated Alzheimer's Disease Rating Scale, which measures cognition and functional ability, with the treatment group showing an average decline of about three points less than that of the placebo group over the 18-month time frame. This means that denanumab performed significantly better than had lacanumab in its main trial. Patients younger than 75 years had the greatest benefit with denanumab. Overall, though, the average change was probably too small to be detected by most patients and their families. One interesting note about the denanumab trial that differed from the prior lacanumab trial is that participants had to have measurable tau buildup in order to enroll. Tau protein was not targeted by the therapy, but the investigators wanted to make sure that participants were either at a more advanced stage or that their disease was progressing more rapidly. A lack of tau protein generally suggests either an earlier stage of the illness or slower disease progression. Narrowing the participants in this way may have predisposed the trial to show a larger difference. In looking at subgroups, patients with low to moderate tau had the most significant benefit, while patients with more tau protein didn't do as well. This suggests the jug may have a sweet spot, which could be useful to clinicians in choosing who would benefit most, though the technology to measure levels of tau is costly and not available at most hospitals. So what are the main concerns with these medications? Well, the biggest side effect that people worry about is brain swelling and bleeding risk, a phenomenon known collectively as ARIA, A-R-I-A, which stands for amyloid-related imaging abnormalities. Nearly a quarter of patients taking the medication in the trial experienced swelling, and nearly a third showed evidence of bleeding. Most of these cases were asymptomatic, resolving over several weeks but three patients did die from brain swelling. Interestingly, patients carrying two copies of ApoE4, now hypothesized to represent a genetic form of Alzheimer's rather than simply a risk factor, seem to be at the greatest risk for ARIA, with up to 40% of them experiencing this side effect. Single gene carriers were in the middle at about 23%, and patients without any copies of ApoE4 only had about a 16% risk, which was similar to the risk of 15% with placebo. One theory is that patients with ApoE4 may have increased permeability of the blood-brain barrier, which could lead to a higher drug concentration of denanumab in the CSF. This is really interesting because it's also been noted that patients with ApoE4 are at increased risk for delirium, another process that may involve permeability of the blood-brain barrier. Despite the increased risk for ARIA, the FDA committee concluded that the benefits still outweighed the risks even for patients with two copies of ApoE4. One of the other major limitations of these medications is the feasibility of treatment. Denanumab requires monthly infusions, an improvement over lacanumab, which requires twice monthly infusions. But patients still have to show up to an infusion center each month and require significant monitoring in between. 
Many places that offer lecanemab and denanemab, including most major academic medical centers, have set up panels similar to tumor boards to evaluate potential candidates and determine who should receive the medication based on likelihood of benefit, risk of side effects, and equitable distribution of resources. What is really unique about donanumab, though, is the fact that it can be discontinued once scans indicate that the amyloid plaque has been mostly cleared, whereas lecanemab, at least initially, was continued indefinitely. For over three-quarters of trial participants in the Trailblazer 2 study, clearance of amyloid occurred by the end of the 18-month study period. It's currently believed that once the plaque is cleared, it will take up to four years for it to begin to accumulate again. During that time, patients will need to be closely monitored for re-emergence of plaque, but don't need to receive monthly infusions. Slowing of disease progression, meanwhile, continues even after stopping the medication. This could be a real game-changer in terms of feasibility of treatment, making it time-limited for many patients with lasting benefits beyond the course of treatment. At the end of the day, if you have patients with mild to moderate Alzheimer's, or MCI, it's worth discussing these options with them to see if they might be interested in learning more. While the benefits are modest so far, even slight delay of progression can be hugely important for quality of life and caregiver burden. Mm -hmm.